All right, thank you very much for um, joining us for this uh, third annual uh, Aquinas Leadership International World Congress uh, related to the theme of uh, educating present and future leaders uh, to promote global peace. And um, once again, I'm going to mention the fact that this I consider to be an historic meeting. I've been saying this for about 20 years uh, with my colleague Curtis Hancock and uh, some members of the, uh, the, the Center for the Study of the Great Ideas, uh, going back to when Curtis and I were involved as uh, officers in the American Maritime Association. Uh, and uh, we had uh, uh, gotten together with some uh, some of our colleagues from the Western Civilization Foundation and with Morton Radler to start uh, the uh, Great Books Academy and Angelicum Academy homeschool programs. Uh, seeing that the civilization, the culture was in serious damage and anticipating that uh, within a couple of decades, uh, while people are, were repeatedly rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic, uh, we thought that uh, we'd have to have something in place uh, as the ship started to go down. And uh, luckily, within the, the past few years, especially, uh, we've been able to make a lot of a lot of progress. I want to thank all of you who've shown up here uh, for this first day of the session to uh, um, help kick off once again what I think is going to be a great meeting. Uh, we had. Uh, several people who, for one reason or another, uh, haven't been able to attend uh, from last year, but still we're going, we have a substantial number of people uh, coming to the session, uh, close to the amount that we had last year without uh, some of the, the attendees. But uh, we're going to start off this session with reflections on uh, Mortimer Adler's uh, uh, work, extensive work, on war and peace. and. Um, while uh, I don't tend to agree with everything Adler says, uh, like I don't tend to agree with everything Maritain says, or even Jilson for that matter, uh, when they say the, the things they say, they always tend to have uh, very um, difficult to refute arguments. Uh, so it's not, not easy to challenge their thought, even when you suspect that there's something uh, underlying it that's not not quite right and so and Adler has in a way I've always admired him for being one of the few people I could think of who's actually like an ancient Greek philosopher in the sense that he who was a pagan huh? more or less for for most of his life and he he thought more or less like a pagan um, which is uh, a kind of necessary condition for doing uh, doing philosophy the way the ancient Greeks did it. Um, and he was also a sense realist. And uh, um, uh, our friend Bill McVeigh uh, pointed out to me a while back that, you know, Adler never really gave up on psychology. Uh, he was always uh, going back to psychology and a kind of behavioristic psychology uh, in, in his work. And I think that this comes out dramatically when you take a look at uh, the way he starts to examine uh, war and peace in terms of health and disease of the soul. So um, I want to thank, uh, among the many number of organizations that have helped to, uh, uh, to, to organize this uh, meeting, uh, the uh, Immaculate Conception Seminary, uh, as well as uh, uh, the Center for the Study of the Great Ideas, uh, uh, the, the Catholic Education Foundation, the London Center for Policy and Policy Research, uh, the uh, uh, International Atheist Gelson Society. Uh, we have some representatives here from Poland, from uh, the journal Studio Gelsoniana, among uh, among other things. Uh, also, uh, uh, Caritas Consulting. There's another group that's been very helpful to us, and the Priority Thinking Institute that have contributed to uh, helping us uh, produce the programs, which we'll be sh here shortly 
in physical form. Right now they're in, in cyberspace. But uh, I want to turn this over at the, at the moment to uh, my colleague Terry Barris from the Center for the Study of the Great Ideas. And um, thank also Max Wiseman uh, for uh, contributing this uh, video of Mortimer Adler for us and making so many of Adler's works accessible to us. Terry. Thank you, Peter. I, I was waiting when you went through that list that you were going to get to someone who you agreed with everything they had to say, but we didn't get that far. Adler not only talks on war, about war and peace in his uh, uh, How to Think About War and Peace, but he ultimately talks about liberal education. And if you're familiar with Adler's work, at some point, you always get around to liberal education. Uh, the Center for the Study of the Great Ideas, with which I'm affiliated, uh, has two missions. And I'll say the first is to try and implement uh, Adler's idea that philosophy is everybody's business. And obviously, philosophy does touch everything that everybody does in some way often unconsciously. Uh, that came up at a session last year when someone says, well, what business people do does implement things like grammar in the broad sense, even though business people may not be consciously aware of that. Uh, but they're obviously concerned with matters of structure of various kinds. The other mission is to try and maintain and advance Adler's legacy and his work. And I go to a few conferences of various kinds, and they may be in touch on philosophical matters, matters of public policy and so forth. And they ask me, well, you know, what's your organization about? And I say, well, have you heard of Mortimer Adler? More often than not, not. Occasionally, I'm happy to find that people are very familiar with his work. Uh, and that includes people, for example, on the faculty at uh, our local, uh, the local branch of the University of Wisconsin. So uh, that's the mixed news there. Uh, last year we talked about that this is the 25th anniversary of our organization. And uh, so Max Wiseman said, be sure to say we're at the 25th and a half point as of June 28th. Now, in case some of you aren't familiar with Adler, uh, I'll give you a little background about him. Uh, he was born um, December 28th of 1902, and it was December 28th of 1990 when our organization was founded. His parents were Jewish immigrants. He dropped out of school at 14, became a copy boy for the New York Sun, and he wanted to be a journalist. Uh, he went back to school on his own to take writing classes, and there he ran into the great authors and the great books. And that's, for a lot of people, maybe we wish it was more, but for a lot of people that can be just change your life. Max Wiseman has said that. He uh, almost accidentally was at a seminar talking about somebody named Plato, and he just felt like, you know, where has this been all my life? Um, Adler went on to study at Columbia. Um, what's now a standard reference work, uh, Wikipedia, uh, notes that he uh, had he contributed to the student liter uh, literary magazine at Columbia um, but as I pointed out I think last year we came across this is again thanks to the internet that Adler when he was 18 years old had a poem published in poetry magazine uh, Adler the poet isn't something that you think about but he was I mean he was published when he would have been in high school if he hadn't dropped out um, Anyway, he uh, didn't get his bachelor's degree from Columbia because he wouldn't take the swimming test uh, that was required to get it to, to fulfill the uh, physical education requirement. Uh, although Columbia ultimately gave him an honorary bachelor's degree in 1983. Uh, he got a, um, his doctorate there in psychology, as Peter, uh, I think, mentioned. Uh, his first book, which was called Dialectic, subject obvious. Uh, was published in 1927 when he would have been about 25 years old. 
Not too long after that, uh, well, at, around that time, he met Robert Hutchins. Uh, Hutchins uh, was then newly appointed president of the University of Chicago. Uh, at that point, Hutchins was 30 years old. And um, how, how do you get to be president of the University of Chicago when you're 30? Well, if you become dean of the Yale Law School when you're 25, it's probably easier. Uh, the philosophy department, uh, professors in the philosophy department, uh, in, in no way were going to have Adler in their department, and he became a professor of the philosophy of law in the law school. Uh, he, um, I leave it at that as far as uh, the background of, of, of his time in academia. Uh, as you might imagine, he uh, didn't, didn't fit that well in an academic setting, at least not the academic faculty. Students may have had mixed feelings about him, but he was not entirely popular with uh, faculty. But then Hutchins had his own problems with the faculty at Chicago at times as well. The book that's the topic of uh, discussion, along with some articles, is How to Think About War and Peace. I would call that the suggested reading, not the assigned reading. But it happens that being something of an Adler fan, I've got a copy, I had a copy. And I don't know how many editions there were. This is a first edition published in 1944. One of the first things in there is this little notice from the publisher about the appearance of books in wartime. A recent ruling by the War Production Board has curtailed the use of paper by book publishers in 1944. In line with this ruling and in order to conserve materials and manpower, we are cooperating by one, using lighter weight paper, which reduces the bulk of our books substantially, two, printing books with smaller margins and with more words on each page. Result, fewer pages per book. Slimmer and smaller books will save paper and plate metal and labor. We are sure that readers will understand the publisher's desire to cooperate as fully as possible with the objectives of the War Production Board and our government. So that had me thinking about war. It's uh, not directly about war and peace as such. Uh, it's concerned only with how to think about war and peace. That's a quote from Clifton Fadiman uh, from his plea to the reader uh, early in the, in the book. And he quotes Adler, it's a book of ideas to think with. So in other words, it's trying to frame the issues, to frame the ideas uh, and clarify ideas uh, so that we can think more clearly about what we mean by war and by peace. Uh, it's not a matter of making plans or proposals as such. Liberal education will take us on a little detour here. Uh, Adler and Hutchins both left part the, the University of Chicago. Uh, Hutchins was involved with the uh, Ford Foundation and uh, ultimately with uh, got his own organization, the uh, Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions. Um, Adler also became involved uh, more deeply with Encyclopedia Britannica, and that led to their work on the first edition of the Great Books of the Western World, this 54-volume uh, collection of great books. Adler, in particular was involved in doing what's called the Centopicon. And people who do know about Adler, that's one of the things that they do uh, recall about him. I'll detour here. The other is that he's the author of How to Read a Book, uh, published in 1940, still in print. You know, I mean, some of you have books. Wouldn't you like to have a book still in print after 76 years? The um, Syntopicon was a kind of topical index, uh, but Adler never did things in a small way. It uh, took 
the I looking for the major ideas, lesser ideas, the, the topics in an index. Well, eventually, the major topics were put under the name the great ideas, and they settled on 102, could have been a little more or less, and about 3,000 subtopics. And these had 168,000 or so references to where those topics were cited in the great books, about 500 included in the set. Uh, and putting together this index was about half of this 200, about this of a $2 million publishing project. So about a million dollars. This Syntopicon was the subject of quite a bit of criticism. Uh, Jim Marusis isn't here, but he pointed out to me that, for example, Marshall McLuhan uh, criticized it in his book, The Mechanical Bride. And, you know, this, to do these top, these uh, uh, references, uh, this uh, grad students were assembled. Uh, it's nice work if you could get it, I guess. And they would go through the books, jot things down on index cards, and then there'd be the boxes of index cards. And in the publicity about the publication of this set of books, there'd be these pictures of uh, the boxes of index cards and some of the grad students and Adler and so forth. Uh, and usually it pointed out that Saul Bellow uh, worked for a time on this project as a grad student. Uh, McLuhan saw the picture in Life magazine of all the indexes out there with the, the great ideas tags on them. And uh, among his comments was it looked like coffins. And for some people, you know, if you it's analyzing things a lot, is you, you, they, they just have this feeling or idea that it kind of deadens them. And maybe sometimes it does. Dwight McDonald had a, a review in the New Yorker. And I laugh, um, but uh, people who are fans of Adler's and the great books, a lot of them still take umbrage at some of the snark uh, that seems to be inspired by things associated with the great books. Uh, the book not too many years ago about the whole great books phenomenon in the 50s and 60s. And uh, it had some colorful, uh, criticism, and maybe I'm just the exception. I don't know. I'm, I think it may be a little unfair, but some of it it's in, seems to be inspired to be very funny as well. Uh, but McDonald, Dwight McDonald uh, had a famous review in The New Yorker uh, when the great books were originally published. Um, and uh, it's one of uh, his best known works. But his criticisms were uh, in the case of the Syntopicon, particularly, uh, just its complexity and its size, uh, they had to be, it was like this WPA project for grad students to assemble it. Um, and as an example, he said, I went to the first topic in science. So there's science, the great idea, a number of topics. He says there's four references, first references, four references to Plato, and it took me an hour to look them up and read them. Well, of course, you had to go get get them, look them up, and then sit and read them. Um, in other words, really questioning the usefulness of it or the likelihood that it was going to inspire people to read them. Uh, Adler, uh, when that project was finished, he founded the Institute for S Philosophical Research in San Francisco. Uh, got some grant money to do it. And... Uh, you might wonder where something like this came from. And um, our honoree the first year, two years ago, worked there, and I forgot yeah, his Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald, okay. Um, he had um, talked about this uh, uh, project and his knowledge of this, uh, the, the, this topic and project and so forth. Um, and Adler, in his first biography, he lived long enough that he had to write a second, um, talks about, he's, he's looking back on this, and uh, what he says is, what, he was, what was he trying to do? 
in this uh, this you know what's what, what's this like, very expensive complex index? Well, what's he trying to get at? Uh, and his ambitions were vast. He says, instead of trying to deal with oppositions among conflicting systems of philosophy, which had been my earlier conception of the project, I now conceive the task as one dealing with the philosophical, co philosophical controversies that have arisen in the sphere of each of the great ideas. The completed syntopicon, I had come to realize, would provide a first tentative and incomplete approximation to a chart, a visual, you can try and see, visualize this, to a chart of the fundamental issues on which philosophies divide. In other words, this is not um, a way of solving these issues, but to clarify them. Uh, and then he, he says, an address delivered in 1916 to the American Philosophical Association by Professor A.O. Lovejoy, titled On Some Conditions of Progress in Philosophical Inquiry, uh, came to mind for Adler. And you know, we're at, it's a hundred years since that uh, address uh, now. I'd be, been deeply impressed by Lovejoy's critique of the failure of philosophers to join issue and engage in well-conducted disputation. I was also inspired by his vision of the advances that might be made in philosophical thought if philosophers were to work cooperatively, not to settle their differences, but to agree about the points on which they differed, uh, to formulate issues with precision and clarity, and to marshal the arguments pro and con. The summa dialectica would lay the groundwork for progress in philosophical thought. What's he getting at there? Uh, his, the, the thought was that they would deal with e each of these great ideas at this Institute for Philosophical Research and go into even greater depth, really comprehensively, about every significant uh, discussion of these topics with the idea that you'd form a clarifying structure for philosophers. So in other words, people might not agree, but they'd agree about what they were arguing about. And at least my impression is it's not unusual in philosophy as well as anywhere else for uh, people to talk past each other. You, know, you get, uh, Robert and I were at a conference recently and there's people saying, you don't understand what, what I just said. Um, but you know, again, it's not a common uh, problem. Uh, my thought at some point had been, gee, I wish there was some reference you could go to just to find out what's the state of the question. Not that things have been resolved, but you know, where are we at right now? Uh, and that's something along those lines is what Adler was talking about. Um, the institute that he founded then, it, uh, he said, it would not engage in philosophical thought, but rather in thinking about, but in thinking about phys philosophical thought past and present, so that philosophical thinking in the future might make new strides in the pursuit of truth. It hopes to discover the extent and kinds of agreements that exist among men who disagree about what is true. So it's, it's a little like this. This isn't a book exactly about war and peace, but an, a book about how to think about it so that we might make progress towards peace if such a thing is possible at all. The first one that came out, this is what, uh, what uh, our uh, honoree of a couple of years ago, he was talking about, was the idea of freedom, which was in two volumes. Um, and as he mentioned, it was just not reviewed particularly much. And um, and cost $600,000. So the, uh, think about that. It's uh, let's assume the, let's assume the project has worth to it, but for each of 102 great ideas, you've got to spend six hundred thousand um, dollars, and with inflation, it might cost say I don't know, nine times that much in today's dollars. You've got a half billion dollar project. It might be worth it, but I don't know who would pay for it. 
And as you might expect, that's kind of what happened um, to the Institute. The ambitions were just so vast, the initial reaction was pretty indifferent, and uh, so it eventually went out of existence. But one thing that did happen there at, the, at that time when uh, Adler was in San Francisco is he hosted um, a live weekly television series on, San, on TV there, um, 52 half-hour programs called The Great Ideas uh, that uh, the Institute for Sil Philosophical Research produced. Um, the local ABC affiliate uh, presented them as a public service um, National Educational Television was also involved. That's the predecessor to today's PBS, uh, but it can only be seen there in the Bay Area. So uh, they had the foresight to film these presentations. And um, I, don't think I don't think videotape was uh, available at the time. And if you've seen kinescopes, which is a technology that was available, uh, those are not very high quality. Um, and so these presentations by Adler were preserved, and eventually he turned those over to our organization, and uh, some members contributed towards transferring them to videotape. And so that's, if we have it, we have the one on War and Peace here to uh, show to you. Now, even with this, the advantage of having film, uh, the video quality you get may not be what you're used to today. Uh, obviously, first of all, it's in black and white. It's 1950s production values uh, and so forth. To bring it down to the present, there was a second edition of this great book set published in 1990. Not much was changed in the selections um, the uh, Syntopicon was simplified somewhat, leaving out like some secondary references, but pretty much the same uh, set. Uh, but it was controversial for a different reason, uh, extremely so, that uh, the new thinking about, I guess I'll call multiculturalism, came into play. The authors are authors in the Western tradition, and um, there's that, um, and up until maybe the uh, 18th century, uh, there wouldn't be many works, at least, by, uh, in the Western world at least, by women, for example. And uh, if you're focusing on the Western tradition, well, then you're not going to have authors from uh, the Islamic or Indian or or Chinese traditions, not because of their race, but because of we're focusing on a particular uh, cultural tradition. Well, uh, that was not in keeping with a lot of people's thinking. And Adler, who was then about 88 years old, was made the front man to deal with issues about this, uh, which it may have been a difficult spot to put him in. He's obviously knowledgeable. Uh, but if you read how he handled these things, uh, these controversies, um, and you can say, well, I wish, he would have, I wish he would have said something a little differently than he did. Uh, basically that, for example, you know, it's not a matter of trying to do quotas or percentages for various uh, groups and so forth. Uh, as far as I know, he doesn't, in the course of defending the work, go into the thing of that, well, you can't, you can't like, make up the test of time. You know, if history was different, you can't try and figure out what if history was different, what works would be the ones that would have been in here by a more diverse group of authors, as diversity is now understood or viewed. Um, but that hurt uh, the the project. Uh, and of course, technology has changed so that sets of books of, of many kinds are, have fallen on hard times. Well, perhaps Adler in this uh, matter and others was ahead of his time in some ways. 
Um, the Centopicon was in, modeled structurally, at least, on a legal encyclopedia, which I, when I was, my career was as a lawyer, and that's, that doesn't add it to its appeal to me. To, <laughs> Um, and it certainly pushed the limits of index card technology. And um, so until computers and the hypertext that you're all familiar with, you know, the linking that you see on, on the web and you just take it for granted, obviously. And that's not that, at least uh, that's not common going back past maybe the 1990s. Um, well, that was you know, all unknown at the time. Uh, interestingly, uh, Jorn Barger, who's basically was a, a blogging pioneer and did a, lot of, did a lot of thinking about some of these matters, um, before these, uh, well, I'll get, I'm getting ahead of myself, uh, talked about this as saying that, uh, you know, Adler was strictly pre-cybernetic. Uh, and so it, now, He's saying getting into the 2000s, you know, uh, the internet, web publishing and so forth might make all of this much more usable. Um, and uh, elsewhere he said that what Adler was trying to do without realizing it uh, would be trying to come up with a philosophy markup language. Uh, markup uh, it comes from the editorial work, but you know, there's this coding, this markup that you don't see when you look at a web page that creates the format and so forth that you see. And basically what the Syntopicon was is that uh, every th all these references were um, you know, kind of behind the scenes marked up. You know, you're going to War and Peace 4A and you're going to every place where that appears that, you know, that, that topic is discussed, and that's all behind the scenes. And while they're trying to do that with 168,000 index cards. Well, lo and behold, uh, June 10th of this year, uh, a publisher called Noet, N-O-E-T, has published a electronic version of Great Books of the Western World, including the Syntopicon. Um, I, I saw it, uh, I think we're on the mailing list at the center. I saw it, you could pre-order it for $99. I pass that along to you, Robert. I don't know if any of you have run into it. You may have missed the pre-order price, but it's $199 if you have. Uh, you might wanna take a look at it, Noet software. And I've done a little bit with it. Uh, Robert, you, know, you may have done more, uh, but it is this thing where you get to, into these topics and it's linked and you go to, for, to use McDonald's, uh, Dwight McDonald's example, you go to the passage in Plato that's talking about, I think it was the nature of science. To be fair, and the, and the problem with the comparison there is, well, yeah, uh, that takes no time, but it still takes the same amount of time to read Plato and if McDonald was complaining that, well, it takes a lot of time to read, you know, uh, pass passages from Plato. I'm not sure that's a criticism of the Syntopicon. Um, but from what I could see, there were there are now two references instead of four because it was somewhat, they did simplify uh, the number of references somewhat. And I read the two passages and it took me about half an hour. And it's like, well, it would take me just as long. You know, no matter what, it's on a computer. I don't can't read it any faster. What I didn't have to do is spend time you know, going and getting it off the shelf, getting a stack of 20 books, uh, 20 volumes of the great books and so forth. It's uh, obviously much uh, easier to use. And if you find that one of those topics, and this, you know, I can see how this would happen. If you can, if you find the topic, that's what you're looking for, uh, you've got the start right there. Anything that's in those great books, you've got that. Now you may wanna go beyond that in whatever your research project is or your interest, uh, but it looks like it might, it at least seems to have some potential to get over some of these hurdles. So I like to think that shows that Adler was literally ahead of his time. 
as, and you know, we are talking about here something that's indirectly inspired by something that Lovejoy says a hundred years ago, and f was it four weeks ago? Uh, we see it in this new form. I think if you did look, for example, there's that lecture. The, I think it was the oldest item that Adler talks about in um, those materials. Uh, it says a lot of what he says at greater length in the book. And that's not unusual for Adler uh, to vary, do variations on a theme. Uh, but he has an idea of you know, what it would take uh, for there to be peace, if peace is possible. Uh, but one thing that is in there is the idea that you'd need a free and democratic society for that to be the case, and that requires a particular kind of education. And the book, he says, the freedom of citizenship can be legally granted and protected, but it cannot be actually realized apart from the development of free men through free minds. Men are by nature born for such freedom, but nothing less than liberal education can discipline men for the political use of freedom, which is the meaning of citizenship. And as I said at the beginning, it always gets back to liberal education, not necessarily as a mean, as an, as a, an end, but as a means. And if you want to talk about ahead of his time, he talks about if peace in the terms that he envisions it is possible. You know, this we might be in the early stages of, say, a 500-year project. Um, but Adler never shies away from a, an immense project. And uh, so that's, you know, his talking that maybe we're in the, maybe we're starting on this road. Maybe we've started on this road, or at least that's where we were in 1940. But you know, maybe this idea that what can you do with the technology that we have to do things with do things with classic texts, for example, that you couldn't do when the technology was books as such and index cards. Uh, maybe as time goes by, there are possibilities opening up that that we never imagined before. And Adler acknowledged that he didn't expect to live to see him. He wasn't going to live. He lived to be exactly 98.5 years old. Uh, I, I'm sure if he could have, he would have lived to be 102, so it matched up with the number of great ideas. Um, but uh, we, we, and that comes up in our organization because it's his it's his birthday. Well, we're halfway between the anniversary of his death, you know, and vice versa. It's just uh, one of those quirks, just a coincidence, and yet uh, something that I think I don't know if Adler would laugh about it. Maybe he would, um, but we. Uh, it, it just seems a little bit one of those things where you know God just has a little mathematical trick for Mortimer Adler there. Um, Adler, by the way, he. His last book was published in 1995, when he would have been about 93. Um, and he was completely retired for a number of years uh, out in California. And you know, died, his, died peacefully and so forth. Um, and so that you know, is as good as, I think he would say, that's about, about as good an end as you might wish for as well. And that gets it to where you know, if he's done things of value, then uh, people who believe that you know, try and do what we can to uh, carry it on. And with that, Peter, I hope that's probably more than enough. So. Thanks. Sure. Thank you very much, Terry. I just want to make an announcement for those of us who are watching this um, on YouTube live streaming. Um, we're going to now watch the, uh, it's about 35 minutes uh, video from Mortimer Adler, but we're not going to live stream that. So set your clocks in, in about 35 minutes or so. We'll be back. We'll have the panel discussion, which we will live stream. So thank you for watching and see you soon.
opportunities 